Next is this mist. Well, I just want to thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. I, I, I love the fact that uh, we have a great, thriving ch church. And I love the fact that I came out this morning after prayer, and I had to put my binoculars on because there were so many people sitting in the back and nobody in the front. <laughs> it was awesome. It was like, well, where's everybody? The missions conference. It just took a lot of people out, you know, because it was so much every day. Four days at church. Oh, no. You know, I mean, it's woo. But I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that, um, that God has placed this on my heart and that um, I'm able to share that with you. And I just want to thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. And I'm excited to share what God has been teaching me this past week. And I got a chance to share with the men. Um, a couple weeks ago, we got to study this, and it's a, it's a really good passage, and it's powerful. And so two weeks ago, you know, because last week we had the missionaries, so two weeks ago we talked about there's four facets of genuine faith. And the four facets of genuine faith, it's not indifferent but involved. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have to be involved. You can't just sit back and let everything bounce off you. Because that's not who God is. God wants you to be involved. And it's not an independent, you're not on your own, but it's a partnership do you know that God is with you through this life? I heard that on a YouTube thing. It's like the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that there's going to be suffering either way, but we have somebody to go through it with us. We have God to go with us through this. Just because you have faith in God doesn't mean that suffering will stop. In fact, Jesus said just the opposite. If you're going to follow me, you're probably going to suffer more because the world hates me, so it's going to hate you. Then the third thing, it's not invisible, but it's on display. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, it should affect your life. It should be on display. It shouldn't be private. That's a lie from Satan, the enemy. Keep it private. Don't show anyone. Just think if Jesus thought that way. None of us would be saved. And it's not just intellectual. It's from the heart. Because remember... Even Satan, the enemy of God, knows who God is and who Jesus Christ is. But he doesn't believe it for his salvation. He fights against it. Is that typical of humans? They're the same thing. They understand who God is. They understand who Jesus is. They just don't want it. So they fight against it. So it's not here. It's up here. And so it all wound up two weeks ago as faith without works is useless. It's as good as dead. And this is supposed to encourage faith-motivated living. This is not to stir doubts about one's salvation. It's supposed to be specific, you wanting to show your faith. Sometimes it can talk about salvation, and it might say, did I really trust Jesus as my personal Savior? But most of the times it's talking to us people that have believed on Jesus Christ as their Savior and said, are you living for him? Is your faith real? Do you really trust me? That's the real question, isn't it? Do you really trust him with everything? Do you know the specific need and have ability to meet the need, but you don't? God says that faith is useless. Dead response. So we're in the book of James. And we like James because he's a down-to-earth type of guy, right? He's very practical. And he's writing to Jewish believers that believe that Jesus is the Messiah, or in the Greek, the Christ. That's why we say Jesus the Christ, or Christ Jesus. That's just Messiah in Greek. Okay? And we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And there was Jews that believed that Jesus is the Son of God. They put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus. But when they did that, there was a cost. It was going to cost them something. In Jewish culture, everything revolved around the synagogue. That's where they taught the Bible, the, the Torah. That's their church. 
And they would go, and all business deals and everything came out of that. They would go and worship, and then they make contacts, and then go out and do their things. Well, if you put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ, they said, oh, that's not the God we want. He can't really be the Son of God. So they'd kick him out of the synagogue, and that, what would happen? They would be ostracized from society, from business, from friendships. So when James is writing to the Jewish believers, he's saying, this is going to cost you something to follow Jesus. But are you still going to trust him or not? Keeping your faith private is a lie from the enemy. You can't do that. You have to display it. And to realize that, you have to understand this might cost you something in this world. But you're going to gain something in the future. Let's pray. My Father, my God, I just thank you for the opportunity to come and teach this word. Lord, thank you for uh, people around me that can input and how you've woven it together. And Lord, I just pray that your words would be in my mouth and that you'd open our hearts and our minds to wisdom and understanding. As we look at your scriptures, as we open the Bible, may we read it carefully and interpret it correctly and apply it enthusiastically in our lives. Lord, open our hearts and our minds. Help us to be changed this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles, we're in James, near the end of the New Testament there after Hebrews. James chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish persons, that faith apart from works is useless? I love that translation because it's like Jesus, or James, at the climax of his book is saying, guys, do you need proof? Because it's in the Bible. Do you need proof? I got it. But faith apart from works is useless faith. He's just reiterating it. He's saying, look, guys. This is important. Faith needs to be worked out in the open. Once again, this is encouraging a faith-motivated culture of living. This is not about salvation, but it could be because you could suddenly realize, wait a minute, eh, do I truly put all my faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ? So it could drive you to salvation, but really James is talking to believers, to Jewish believers specifically. But that's not the main point. The main point is you're to be an example of a Christ follower. Now there's a great illustration, marriage. Marriage. Guys, when you put this ring on your finger, ladies, when you put your ring on your finger, what does that mean? What's that symbol mean? You're in a committed relationship, right? You're married. You're all in with this one person. Now, does this ring make the marriage? This ring is a symbol. What makes the marriage? Your actions. There's more to being married than just putting a ring on the finger and saying, I do or I will. You think about it. Those things that are necessary, you need to spend time with your wife or your husband. Can your relationship grow if you don't spend time together? No. It stays in a hovering pattern at the best. At the worst, it goes backwards. Suddenly, your wife or your husband's a stranger. Or how about this relationship, cultivating it? Do you remember when you were dating? Guys, girls, do you remember that? You'd go out, you can't wait, you get all dressed up, you get, you get the money out to go somewhere, walk, go to a movie, eat, go out to eat. You just couldn't wait to spend time with that person, right? And then you get married and it sweats in a t-shirt. <laughs> and you're like, hey, let's dust off our nice clothes and go out on a date. And your spouse is probably saying, a date, what's that? I haven't had one of those since we were dating. Or how about just spending time together in love, just saying, I love this person. When you look at your wife, when you look at your husband, you're like, I love this person. When people look at your interaction, do they say, wow, those people are in love. They love each other. They don't need a ring because you can tell by their actions they're married. 
they're committed. So this ring may be an advertisement to show everyone, hey, I'm spoken for, but it's your actions that really dictate whether you're spoken for or not. Look, faith is internal, but then it manifests itself externally. And that's why when you don't see it outward, you wonder, do they truly love Jesus or not? What's going on? So faith would be the root in your life, and your work would be the fruit of your life. So you're, you have a fruit tree, and what if it doesn't produce fruit? What do you think about that tree? It's worthless. Yeah, there, there's the garden over there. Cut it down. I don't have any time to waste with that. Thank the Lord that he's patient with us, right? But if this is not producing fruit, you're like, why waste the time? God works in here. God works through me. And it is God's work in me. All of this, you know what they call this? Worship. Worship. Worship is just not singing. And some of you are like, thank the Lord, because if they heard me sing, it would be rotten fruit. Worship is just not singing. It's the whole aspects of your life. God works for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, it's not how bad we are. It's how good Jesus is. And God, Jesus, died on the cross for us. And then, after we accept that gift from God, God works in us by the presence, power, and person of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Because once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live where? In us. Think about that. When you turn off the lights, you're not alone. God is there. When you say, God can't see me because I have the lights off. God is in the room with you. God is in you if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And then God works through us to begin changing our lives. And there's that big, big religious word that we always talk about, sanctification. God starts working in you to training your mind, training your actions to react like Jesus acts and reacted. Because that's what we want. Because our reactions are always great. No. Our reactions normally are gross. But God starts going through it. And that's fruit. This life, in this life that we live, the things we do, that's called works. How we react, how we interact, our relationships, what we're doing. God is working through us, and all through those things, it's worship to him. It's not just trying to, hey, look at me, look at me. What you're doing is worshiping God and what you do, your fruit. It can also be called worship. Now, I want to say this. This is not perfection, okay? This is called progress. When you get saved, are you perfect? No. Not in our actions, but be standing before God, we're perfect. Yeah. We're that other religious word, justified, justification. Just as if we never sinned. Because Jesus took the punishment, the payment. So all that pay, that's debt, that's gone. And so God the Father sees us through his Son as pure and righteous. But while we're living on this world, we're not perfect. We still struggle with sin. There's combating. And we have different groups that help us to get tools to fight those desires to go contrary to God. So the question is, what's happening in your life right now? Are you running? You're hiding? You're staying away from God? Keeping it private? Or are you progressing? 
Are you striving? Are you battling? What do you mean by that? Well, here, do you hate sin? Do you love Jesus? Do you want to learn what God says in his word in this book? Do you get in the book? Do you want to meet God's people? Are you learning how to worship God in song and in action and in deed and in thought? Are you learning to be generous towards others? Here's a great question I came across. If you never met Jesus, what in your life would be different? Hopefully it's a lot. But if you say, well, God never really did much. It's not really important. Well, then what's the difference of believing in him and not believing in him? God has work for you to do. Do you know that? Do you guys know that? Faith is what you believe, and then it shows up in how you behave. Ephesians 2.10, this is Teresa and my favorite verse, our life verse. We had this for missionaries all the time. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. God has a plan set from the foundation of the world about your life today. Think about that. He made all the stars and everything, and he still he has a plan for your life. Now here's the question, does God need your work? No, he doesn't need your work, but he chooses to use you. God doesn't need your work, but your neighbor does. The people around you. You are God's example here on earth for others. What kind of example are you? Are you a good example or are you a bad example? So look, just don't hear the word. You need to do what it says. Don't just have faith, you have to have obedience in the works that God has given you to do. If God's telling you to do something, you need to do it. Has God ever told you something and then you didn't do it? Or how about God's told you to do something and you said, all right, and you do it with this, okay, just take it, I've done that. And then I have to repent and I'm like, oh. And then, if God the Father has called you, is he going to provide for you? Is he going to catch, catch you? Is he going to save you? If God's called you to do something, is he going to equip you to do it? Or is he just, oh, you're going to fail. Do this and watch you fail. Ah, that's what I want to do. Is that what, is that God's character? Absolutely not. God equips you. Faith is not something that we work up. Faith is something that God works in. God gives us faith to have faith. And that's kind of hard to understand. Like, what are you talking about? How does that work? Well, apart from God, we would reject God. We would. We would reject him. Because what's our natural tendency? Oh, I can do it. If you doubt me, look at the world. The world says, I can get to heaven. I can do it on my own. I'm better than that person. We need to have a humbleness, a helplessness, a need for God, a realization that we will not measure up. For we all fall short of God's glory. All of us. Well, some are better than others. It doesn't matter. They still fall short. Way short. Not even close. Faith is something we work out with the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? Faith is something we work out with the Holy Spirit. Look at this, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. I always wondered about this verse. Look at this verse. Dear friends, you, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what he pleases, pleases him. This is one of those verses where it says, work out your faith with fear and trembling. 
another translation says. Faith is something we demonstrate that demonstrates itself in works. So the question is, are you working your faith out in front of others? Or are you holding it close? When a husband loves his wife and a wife loves her husband, you can see it, can't you? You see it. You say, that is awesome. When someone loves and trusts God, can you see that? You see it. You say, what is going on? How can you be happy in a situation like this? How can you do this? Well, James gives us examples, which is awesome. So James 2, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And so it, just, so it happened, just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. Now look, this is a great example. Abraham, the founding father of the Israel nation. God calls him up. And let me give you some history. Here, here's Abraham. He's living in his country, just hanging out, just having a good time, has a beautiful wife, but doesn't have any kids. And God appears to him talks to him and says, look, Abraham, I want you to leave this country, leave your family, and go to a land where I'm going to show you, and I'm going to give it to you. Guess what age that was? 75. And he said, don't worry, I'm going to be with you, and you're going to be a great nation. Well, Abraham goes. And then God makes a second promise, but a lot of people don't understand this because it was chapter 12 when he made the first promise, Chapter 15 is when he made a second promise. You know how many years went by? Probably 11. We read it and we're like, the next day. No, no. This is 11 years down the road. And the second promise is this. In Genesis 15, it says this. It says this. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up in the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. This took place 11 years after the original promise. 11 years after. And Abraham is saved because why? He believed God. He had faith. And his faith was in his actions. His faith outworked his fruit. He had deep roots, and his fruit, you could see, because he did what God told him. So Abraham, he's there. And Abraham's freaking out because he's like, I'm 84. My wife is still not having a child. Come on, God. If I die, my servant's going to get all my stuff. Abraham, and God said, no, I'm going to give you an heir. And he believed. Now, of course, it started taking a long time. And so Abraham and Sarah kind of said, let's do it ourselves. Let's help God out. God needs some help. So in those days, you could take the handmaiden or the servant of the wife and have relations with her and have a child, and that would be your child. So Sarah says, hey, let's follow the culture. And Abraham, being the strong leader, said, no way. Was Abraham perfect? No. Was he saved? Yes. Abraham, okay, if you, if you, if you insist. So he has a child with the, with the slave, and, you know, a while later, when he's 99 years old, once again, the Lord appears to him and says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a child. And he says, I know you gave me a child. His name's Ishmael. And God says, no, I'm going to give you a baby through Sarah. Now, the ridiculousness of it is because she's 89, and she's like, yeah, right. First of all, I don't know if I want a child at 89. Second of all, there's no way. And she kind of laughs. And Abraham believed God. 
He loved his son Ishmael, but he believed God. And so when Abraham turns 100, guess what happens? He has a son from Sarah, Isaac. And that's, you think Abraham's excited? You think Sarah's excited? Yes. Now, is Abraham saved? He saved. He believed. God gave the promise. Well, we don't know exactly, but let's say 15 years. It may be more, maybe a little less, but it was old enough where Isaac is a teenager. He's, he's strapping. And once again, God appears to Abraham and says, Abraham, isn't it great that you have a son? He said, yeah, you're awesome, God. Well, you know what? I want you to do something for me. Take your one and only son that you got from Sarah, take him over to a mountain that I'm going to show you, and sacrifice him to me. How many people's faith just stopped? You know what Abraham did? Okay, God, I've trusted you this far. I'm all in. So he takes his son to go sacrifice him. And they go away with servants. And they go and then they, he sees a spot, which by the way, tradition says it's where Jerusalem is. And they believe that's where Jesus was sacrificed on. There's no hard pro or proof to that, but it's near it. And so Abraham takes his son, keeps the servants back. They take the wood, they take the fire, and they, they head on up. And they're going up, and Isaac's walking along, and Isaac puts two and two together. He goes, uh, Abraham, Dad, we have a problem here. We're going up this mountain to sacrifice something. We got the wood, we got the fire, we got the knife. Where's the ram, the lamb? You know what Abraham said to his son? The Lord will provide. Is that, is that faith? Isaac goes, oh, okay. They go up there, build an altar, put the wood on. And can you imagine what's happening right now? Abraham takes his son Isaac, ties him up, and puts him on the altar. What do you think Isaac's thinking right at the moment? Uh, but do you think Abraham kept secret that Isaac was a promise from God? No. Come on. He's a miracle baby. He was born when he was 100 and his mom was 90. Wouldn't you have questions? And Abraham takes up the knife to kill his son. And God says, stop. Don't lay a hand on your son. Because I now know that you love me more than anything. And over in the thicket, caught by the horns so that it wouldn't be blemished, was a ram. Did God provide? Abraham, was he saved? Was his works demonstrating that he was saved? How many of us, our works would have ended when God said, sacrifice your son to me? Be honest. Do we trust our kids to God or not? Do we trust our spouse to God or not? Everything's okay except when you do this. Wow, right? But it's important to understand, was Abraham perfect? No way. He needed God's grace and favor and mercy. Guess what, people? You need God's grace, favor, and mercy. We're not perfect, but God is always gracious and kind and there. Abraham needed to have faith in God's word. And what did God tell him? This is the son of the promise, and I'm going to make him a great nation. And Abraham thought he was going to have to kill his son. But you know what else he thought? That God had the power to raise him from the dead. Is that faith? We need to have faith in God's word. What does God's word tell us? That Jesus, that God is with us constantly. <coughs> that he has a plan. 
Do we have to understand that plan? Do you think Abraham was like, okay, when he's 15, God's going to ask me to kill him, and that'll be good, and I'll pass it? Because you think Abra that was on Abraham's radar? <coughs> Listen, there's only one way to God, and that's what God's word says. That's through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Do you believe it or not? And that's the thing about God. He gives you the choice. He doesn't make you come to him. He gives you the choice. So you're saved by grace, not by works, but you're saved in faith, and that faith should have fruit. If you don't have fruit, you wonder, did you truly get saved? But here's the thing. It doesn't matter how bad you are. You can have faith in God and what he did on the cross, and you will be saved. Isn't that exciting? It doesn't matter how bad you are. It's a matter how good he is. Verse 24. Excuse me. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Your faith cannot be private. Everybody hear that? Did we shut down? Yeah? Okay. So there you go, guys. You're just going to have to go with me. All right. I'm sorry, but the truth is your faith cannot be private. It can't. You need to demonstrate your faith to everyone. The world says, hide it. God says, show it. Abraham believed and had faith, and it changed his behavior. Does your faith change your behavior? It should. Think about, you know, I used this illustration before about the missionary and the Muslim. And the Muslim comes to the missionary and says, you said, if I declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I'll be saved. And the missionary, that's absolutely true. You, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's alive today, you will be saved. I declare that Jesus is the Son of God, I'm saved, Woohoo! And the missionary says, yes, that's awesome. Now let's go tell your neighbors. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. Does he have true faith? Is your faith true faith, or is it just words? Do you just come here and say, I did the check off, I'm good? Or does it affect your behavior? Verse 25 of James 2 says this. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away on a different road. Let me give you a background. You might not know who this person is. Rahab was in the city of Jericho. And what happened 40 years ahead in the past, the nation of Israel was under Egypt rule. And God, through a miraculous plagues and things, took Egypt out, or took Israel out of Egypt. And they wandered around, and then they came to the Red Sea. And the interesting thing, there's two mountains on either side, the Red Sea here, and here comes Pharaoh's army, because they're like, what did we do? We just got rid of all our slaves. Let's go get them. Let's kill them some, then bring the rest back. So they're on the way, and the Israelites are freaking out after all the miracles that God just did. And Moses gets up and says, Behold the salvation of the Lord. He, he puts his hand, his staff, over the, river, uh, the sea, and guess what happens? It divides. This huge sea divides. And not only that, the ground is dry. And the Israelites go through the sea. And they come out the other side. Well, Israel, or the, the Egyptians are like, they did it, can't we? Let's go. We can do it on our own. So they went, and now the Israelites are freaking out after they just walked through this whole, have anybody seen the Prince of Egypt, that cartoon? That's so cool. The walls and their fish are dropped. Oh, it's just awesome. Anyway, they get through, and they're on the other side. They're freaking out. Here come the Egyptians. And Moses is like, what's the matter with you people? Look. Boom. He puts his hand up. Boom. The river, the, the water comes back and kills all the Egyptians. And so they're celebrating. Woohoo! And so Moses, they go get the Ten Commandments and the rest of the laws on this Mount Sinai. Then they go over to the Promised Land. They're about to enter the Promised Land, and the people are freaking out. Oh, there's giants. We can't do it. Our God's not strong enough. Two of the guys were like, Are you crazy? 
Do you remember what just happened? We can do it. Everybody else, no, let's follow these other ten guys. And so God says, well, you don't have faith in me? Guess what? You can't go in. But your children can, so you're going to wander around for 40 years in the desert. Do you realize in that 40 years God provided manna for everybody? Daily, except the Sabbath day. There was a rock that fouled them around, gushing out water for over a million people. That's pretty cool. Their sandals never wore out. They had the same pair of shoes for 40 years. That's pretty cool. That doesn't happen today in our day, in our day does it? Anyway, so they get all done. They come back over, and they come to the Jordan River. And Moses, for a bunch of reasons, can't go with them. So he dies up on the mountain. And Joshua, one of the spies that said, we can do this, is going to lead the crew. And they come to the Jordan River, and it's flooded. It's, it's springtime, and it's over flooded. And so what happens? God does another thing. The, the Ark of the Covenant comes out, and they touch the edge of the bank of the water, and the waters divide. And they walk across on dry ground. Is there a theme here? So they come across, and they come across, and now they're on the right side of the water, and there's Jericho. Jericho was known for its walls. But guess what the people inside of Jericho heard about Egypt, how they were decimated, about waters being divided, how the, how the Jews wandered around for 40 years and made it out of the desert, thriving? Go into the desert and run around. You'll make it 10 days, maybe, you know, without the help. And so they're there, and this is what Rahab says in Joshua. In Joshua 2, he's talking to the spies and says this, No wonder, Joshua 2.11, it says, No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Does that sound like a declaring that God is the one and true God? Rahab is freaking out. Rahab is like, are you kidding me? You guys are going to destroy us. And what happened is Joshua sent two spies in instead of 12, because the last time that didn't turn out too well. So he sent in two spies, and two spies were scoping out. The king got heard about it, and they hid in an inn or a prostitute's house. And the prostitute, Rahab, heard about him, and she hid them from the king's men while they were looking for him. I want to ask you, was that the easier path for Rahab? What would have happened to Rahab if he said, oh, here they are? What would have happened? You're a hero. You've got it. Now we can hold them as hostages. Now we can do things. But Rahab, instead of choosing this temporary woohoo, she said, no, I'm going to follow God. And I want to join God's people. So Rahab chose God over temporary rewards. And the story happens. If you want to learn about it, you have to read Joshua. Get in the book. There you go. So, so, so Rah and the cool thing about Rahab, do you realize that Rahab is in the, the geological lineage of Jesus Christ? That's cool. So verse 26 of James chapter 2, and it says this. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. James restates that your faith cannot be private. Live for Jesus. After all, Jesus gave everything he had for you. What should you give in response? I mean, he gave you everything. What should you give? Is that biblical? Guess what? I, I have a verse. Romans. Anybody know what's happening in Romans? You know what chapter I'm going to? 12, verses 1 and 2. Here it goes. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Hmm. 
Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This is what God wants from us. Total trust. Total trust. I want you to think about this. Um, our kids, we lived in a camp that was surrounded three sides by water. And so it was very important that our kids learned how to swim. Very important. We didn't do it the traditional way because we didn't have a pool. Because a lot of times, this is how I learned, as a dad, you're sitting in a pool and you say, okay, son, jump to me. Right? And you're standing there on the side on dry, firm ground, and your dad is down there in the water saying, I got you. I don't know if you can relate to this, but then what do you do? You jump. And who catches you? Your dad. And you're safe. You feel secure. You're there. You jump. You jumped in, and you're in a pool that could kill you, but you're surrounded by what your father has for you, his arms. My question to you, God is sitting in the pool saying, okay, jump. Trust me. And a lot of us look at what's around and say, that's scary. Now, I remember at the side of the pool, that's scary. But why did I jump? Because I trusted my dad. The question is, are you willing to trust your God and Father? Because he's saying, jump, I got you. Now, I will say this, when I jumped in, did water get splashed on me? In fact, I kind of think I went, because <laughs> water went in my face. Does that mean that when we're, God is saying, trust me, that we won't get water in our face? We might. But who has us? God can just, God, God can change your life. He can save your soul, alter your destiny, and rewire your story of your life. Rewrite that story of your life. Isn't that a great place to be in? So in conclusion, we talked about, I, there's 13 big tests in James, and we just covered the fifth one. So there's four of them at first. The first one is a test of perseverance and suffering. The second one is a test of blame and temptation. The third one is the test of information. The fourth one is the test of pure love. And the last one, this one, is the test of good works. Good works. Are you going to do, what are you going to do with this challenge? God is saying, trust me with your life. Trust me, I've got you. So the question is, are you living for yourself or are you living for God? And I don't care how old you are, young or old. If you're here, God has a plan for you. You're not done. You're done when you see Christ face to face. And even then, you might have more stuff to do in heaven. I don't know. But it's going to be awesome. So the question that I have for you, the challenge I have for you, are you going to jump into God's arms? Or are you going to stay on the side of the pool? Let's pray. My Father, my God, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you how it challenged me. I thank you how I'm excited and that I want to serve you and that I, wanted, I want to please you. I want to give my whole life to you. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you inspired James to write this letter, and thank you how it impacted me 2,000 years later, and I pray that it impacts us all to change our behavior and jump into your arms. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor John, for sharing that this morning.